everyone. Um, go ahead and call to order the Portsmouth School Board public meeting for December 14th, 2021. Um, we'll start with the roll call. Board, Jeff Landry, Hope Van Epps, Margo Peabody, Ann Walker. Here. Tara Kennedy. Here. Kristen Jeffrey. Here. Nancy Clayberg. Here. Brian French. Here. Pip Clues. Here. Kimberly Malinchi. Here. McDonald. Um, can we go ahead and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll start with the acceptance of minutes from our November 23rd regular meeting. Move to approve. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? All right. Um, um, we'll go ahead and do a, do we need to do a roll call? roll call with him on the line here? Uh, I think we do. Um, we'll go ahead and do a quick roll call vote for acceptance of minutes. Uh, Ann Walker? Yes. Barry Kennedy? Yes. Kristen Jeffrey? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Fifth clues. I abstain. Great. Thank you. All right. We'll go ahead and move into public comment. Um, we have a few folks on our list tonight. Welcome. And um, go ahead and call folks up to the podium. Um, three minutes. We'll keep a timer, and I'll just let you know when you have about 30 seconds left. So the first one is Becky. Are you here? Come on up. And um, if you can just say your name and your address to start us off. Okay, great. <laughs> Becky and Molly. Oh. Maya, sorry. No, I was like, <laughs> Hi, Maya. Hi. Oh, my. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Maya McKinnon, and um, this is Becky Sidwa. And we are members of We Speak and the NAACP Youth Council. Um, we're here tonight to thank Ms. Jeffrey <laughs> for her contributions <laughs> to our community as we move forward making the Portsmouth School District an inclusive and safe community for all. Um, specifically, her advisorship during the last two years that has helped our work with teachers, administration, and the city council. During these two years, she has attended our meetings and worked collaboratively with us to write policies that are being used to create a change. Uh, and as such, she has supported the We Speak mission. Um, the We Speak mission and vision is that Portsmouth School District will function as a fully inclusive, space, safe space to grow and joyful place where students and staff are trusting relationships and practice progressive educational practices that value all individual and differences. Students and staff will experience an enriched community where all voices are recognized as important and strengthened due to our differences, not spite of them. Again, we thank you for your continued support, and we have a small gift of appreciation that I'll present now. Aww, thank you, ladies. Lisa Rappaport. Hi, my name is Lisa Rappaport, um, 139A South Street in Portsmouth. Um, I'm speaking today with some reluctance because I'm not sure if I have the right words, but 
as a parent of kids in our district, as a volunteer in our schools, and as a member elect of this board, I just feel like I have to say something today. Um, today is the anniversary of the school shooting at Sandy Hook, where 28 people died, including a lot of kids who would have been in high school today. Last week, there were many different unsubstantiated reports circulating in our community about a Portsmouth High School student who allegedly had plans to bring a gun to school and a hit list of people they intended to target. These rumors started circulating early last week and spread rapidly as students and parents took to social media. And I fully appreciate that we can't believe everything that we see on Snapchat and Facebook. I fully appreciate that our students have a right to privacy and I fully respect that details of any emergency response plan would not be shared publicly so that it remains effective if there's an emergency. But our school community is badly shaken by these rumors and students and parents and teachers and staff are anxious and scared and rightly so. These rumors circulated a week after a school shooting in Michigan where school administrators there allegedly investigated a potential threat and then sent the shooter back to class with a gun. <sighs> Against this backdrop, as much as we want to trust that everyone in a position of responsibility did the right thing in Portsmouth, I think we have a right to know more about what actually happened and how it was handled and how we can get more transparency if there's a situation like this in the future. It might be that everything worked exactly like it was supposed to in Portsmouth last week with an investigation and a response that was exactly right and addressed any potential threat if there was one. But without more transparency and communications, we're left only with the rumors that are quite frankly really terrifying. Um, our students are dealing with really high anxiety already right now from living with this pandemic for so long. And the situation last week only made them feel more anxious and a lot of kids stayed home from school because they didn't feel safe or because their parents didn't feel safe sending them and our teachers are stressed to the max from this pandemic and the situation only added to their stress and we all need to trust that our schools are safe so I would ask respectfully that any details about this situation that can be shared right now be shared and if the rumors aren't true at all, or if there's misinformation that needs to be cleared up, I feel like this just needs to be done as clearly and as quickly as possible. Um, these issues are so hard and we all want what's best for our kids and for our teachers and our schools and we want everybody to be safe. But we also need to trust and understand what's being done to protect our kids' safety. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Do we have anyone else here for public comment? Did you have anyone on the... I can ask uh, anyone that's in the Zoom audience if you'd like to raise your hand uh, for public comment. We have some folks. You can use the raise hand feature and we'll give you your three minutes. Zoom audience going once. Voice. No comments from the Zoom audience. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> we'll go ahead and close public comment. Um, and before we move into special presentations, um, one thank you so much, obviously, to our We Speak group and students. And um, yes, I'm going to save some of my comments for the end, but um, I really do appreciate it. And, you know, so many people have reached out already. So we know several of us, this is our last meeting, and maybe I should have started with that. <laughs> um, I mean, no, it's a funny small group tonight, but uh, but we, we deeply appreciate all the kind of uh, love that you guys have been giving us um, in different places. So. Um, and uh, Lisa, to just um, kind of, I guess, address the, the question, um, we have 
been talking a little bit as a board um, with our administration. Two things are kind of happening right now. One is there's de definitely have heard the, the call for as much transparency as possible and we'll be continuing to talk about that with the high school staff and kind of figure out what's appropriate there in the short term. And then um, while we didn't want to put it on the agenda that had already gone out for this week, we did um, make note for the first meeting in January to have a conversation just about um, you know, what can be pl public in terms of our, our plans and ensuring that the public understands kind of what we do have in place systematically um, for any issues of uh, safety in the buildings and things of that nature, not just this specific one. So, um, you know, to everyone out there, thank you for bringing up concerns. And if, obviously, if folks are feeling anxious or if students have that, um, you know, there's <coughs> definitely reach out um, to counselors and building administrators and things like that. Um, all right, so I think that brings us to our special presentations tonight. And um, are you guys good going in the order on the agenda here? Um, Jeanette, that would be you first, great. So we're gonna start with um, <coughs> our special education presentation and um, hear from Jeanette we um, I know we had a chance you know last meeting to read over your notes and your report thank you in advance for just being so thorough and um, certainly you can you know assume that we've kind of gone through that and um, come with some of the questions and things of that nature too so sure and thank you so much for accommodating my household needs which were both a illness in the house as well as a move uh, and moving with uh, four children in tow six chickens, two cats, mm -hmm. and two rabbits was quite a task. So <laughs> I appreciate you guys' flexibility and let me get bumped uh, a little bit. Uh, a couple things I'll just highlight, and you have them in front of you, is uh, in that success column, there's a lot about um, compliance <laughs> um, and some reviews that we had by the Department of Education that we came out fine. <laughs> um, the indicator 13, I don't put a lot about it, but it really is are our IEPs written for our high school students with a look at their life after high school and their uh, transition into adulthood and their specific requirements around that. But more importantly, it's about uh, thinking about students um, transition outside of our school and into the community. And so we came out fine compliance wise. Um, and that was, uh, I'll give credit to the Department of Ed. They did a lot of front work with us uh, two years in advance, letting us know what they'd look for. Um, giving some trainings and our staff really felt prepared for that visit that happened in the spring So that was a nice uh, relationship builder with the Department of Ed where we had good training good awareness ahead of time That we really felt prepared for that indicator 13 review um, I would like to also highlight preschool in that column and that we did make some changes this year in expanding the length of our hours for our programming um, and also uh, promoting uh, enrollment beyond what we're required to do, which is special education services, to invite peers in um, on a tuition basis, a very small monetary fee to come to our preschool. And we're certainly seeing that demand is increasing that I talk about later. Uh, challenges are what we're facing across, <laughs> I think, the education system of everyone kind of feeling stretched in their, do their duties. And uh, we are lucky enough to be professionally staffed right now, other than we were attempting to add a second BCBA for behavioral needs. We have had not a single applicant for that position um, that we had not planned for at the beginning of the year. And we advertised and I haven't had any um, takers, but I do, I would say we're filled because we, we are where we thought we would be at the end of last year for professional staff, paraprofessionals, not. <laughs> I haven't had a full paraprofessional staff this entire school year or last school year. Um, at the point of this, it was seven. We've been as high as 13 vacancies this school year for paraprofessionals. And certainly I, I referenced throughout this increased demands, um, referrals in special education. For example, <laughs> I'll use the high school. They had 13 referrals to special education in the first couple of months. That's typically about the number of referrals we have in a school year at the high school level. Um, some of those led to evaluations, some did not, but there certainly was a heightened level of concern that people were bringing to the table students that they wanted a team to brainstorm around. Uh, highlight on work related to school board goals. Um, 
kind of everything we do in the Department of uh, what my role is and people support is related to those school board goals. Um, I think something that I heard when I reached out to staff to say what would you like me to share with the board was they felt our students that had been invited in early last year really kind of uh, were very comfortable with the return to school this year and the in-person learning because many had already started that in the fall and the spring of last school year more so than some of our um, students that weren't on IEPs. And I also heard very clearly that there was a collaboration going on between special education uh, and regular educators as a resource. Um, you know, coming to um, our special educators with um, difficulties for problem solving more so than they ever have before. So major initiatives that might have future budget impact kind of relates back to uh, earlier um, things that were on here. We're certainly seeing a need for early interventions and that has been, I, I feel sometimes like I'm saying the same thing every year, <laughs> uh, that early interventions and the support for such, um, that is around preschool. We, we, we opened it up and we certainly filled it up <laughs> immediately with what we opened for available spots were filled. We have no spots to offer and we'd like to offer more uh, for anyone that would like to come to a preschool program that we're offering, we'd like to have the availability and right now we do not. Um, when I talk about staff being stretched, I feel that particularly, and I think I said this last school year, in the elementary case loads, um, we are meeting the IEP needs uh, from a legal standpoint, but certainly uh, to improve quality and to lower that stress level of our elementary case managers, it certainly would be helpful to have additional staff there. And then our related service providers, our occupational therapists, speech therapists, for example, um, we have not this year been able to provide the interventions that would, for example, going into a kindergarten classroom, something clicked on me, <laughs> uh, going into a kindergarten or a first grade classroom, we really have been at the level of just providing IEP services. And we had gotten to a point when we added some staff in OT and speech to be able to do more intervention and we're back to the point of really we're just providing IEP services. And a theme that you've probably heard from other administrators is mental health concerns and the need for family-centered supports. And I, I put this on here, but I think it does go beyond the need in special education. It's a universal need that doesn't have to be a special ed initiative. It can certainly come from general education. Um, we've talked about clinical social workers. Uh, I talked about additional BCBAs, school psychologists. All those could help in this arena. Uh, just some points to make. Uh, Medicaid training. We're always training because the rules are always changing. <laughs> so uh, we, we have a round of trainings uh, with a, a, a contracted person that keeps up to date and then keeps us up to date so that we can keep that funding stream in place. Um, and again, expansion of preschool needs is uh, something that we're always looking at and what we can do there. I highlight a few other things. We have two school psych interns and those have helped tremendously with our evaluation processes. Um, Little Harbor, I make a note that we just met with New Hampshire Best Buddies and they're gonna start a chapter and the thought is for them to start the chapter and then look into the other elementary buildings as well. Those are kind of in process, not yet in place, but um, definitely interest and kind of moving forward. In addition to special ed, I am the um, homeless liaison for the district and I just make a note here that uh, we're currently splitting transportation costs for 12 students from eight different school districts and I give a quick note about the expenses around such uh, for two months, basically, September and October. That certainly has been a change from last school year where we had very limited transportation costs because uh, students um, were using remote services. Uh, I give some figures here about the IDA funds. There really hasn't been a substantial fluctuation. Our costs go up, the funds remain about the same. <laughs> so uh, that's the story there. Uh, we did get a small amount of money from the American Rescue Plan Act um, that we're going to use for supplies, technology, and things of that nature. And then I uh, give the numbers uh, of a point in time. I always say I take a snapshot, just stick with the date, because I can check the next day and we have plus or minus one or two. Uh, so this is the snapshot of students that um, were in our IEP system as of the 12th of November. So certainly I'll uh, answer any questions. Just wanted to run through a couple of quick highlights. <laughs> Go ahead, Ann. I just wanted to comment. I, I appreciate having uh, the number of IEPs at each of the schools. It kind of gives us a, I, I realize that was November and this is December. 
and everything changes. Plus or minus 10 on any, yeah. <laughs> in any direction. <laughs> exactly, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Go ahead, Ann. Uh, Nancy. If you had to add up um, how much it would cost for us to give you every staff person that you would like to have, like the BCBA, the paraprofessionals, how much would that be? Um, I'd turn to Off Nathan for those figures. What, what I'll say first of all is there's there's a piece of if we were fully staffed and hired, that would be right now an additional eight or nine people because I would right now be looking for a BCBA and to fill those seven pair of positions which are budgeted for. So that's one piece. Uh, the second piece is looking towards the future. Um, we'll be talking more about this in budget times, but a, a couple of additional case managers is going to be discussed as well as some related service provisions in addition to, I would hope to be fully staffed with what I would like to have right now. <laughs> and I, you know, it's that times whatever it costs to have a teacher. Um, I, I just, Nathan, can we use ESSER funds for any of these um, vacancies that, I mean, especially when she, when you're talking about mental health of students, I mean, is it possible that we can like supply a BCBA with that kind of, with that funding? So, so I guess we've said, I'm going to want to repeat it. We've said right along, uh, uh, mental health support, social emotional learning, even to some great extent, faculty, I mean, you could, the ESSER funds could be used flexibly, but we've just tried to caution every step that, uh, like we learned with the ERA funding back in the two, early 2000s, the cliff effect is you get comfortable with having staffing at a level that you then have to work into your budget. Right. So we're hoping that we can focus more on one-time kind of needs. In this case, I think it's less about the funding and more about the hiring, no yeah. trying okay. to find we the have people. The money yeah. allocated We've got budget for all these for... vacancies, correct? It's just they're no. we don't correct <laughs> for the eight. For for a snapshot of this year, those seven yeah. pair the positions seven that are not and filled, the and the BCBA yeah. due to us not hiring for an extended mm -hmm. time, we have the money to do that this year, and we have not had applicants to do it. <laughs> Is it because we're not paying a competitive? We're not offering a competitive rate for the BCBA, for instance. Um, uh, we are we are comparable to others in the education field. Certainly, a BCBA is a unique position in that it can be done through a medical provider, and oftentimes it's also through special purpose schools, which may run year round and then have a salary that is comparable to that. Um, however, that could make us attractive for some people that don't want to work, for example, during the summers. Um, I, I think we'll have better luck in advertising that at a more typical time in the spring for a, a person to prep their family <coughs> for a decision to work in a school system for next school year. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a degree of hope <laughs> related to uh, hire in that position for next school year. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering also, is there, um, are there organizations that have BCBAs available to like work on a contract basis or? We, we currently do that. Um, so uh, that's been part of the discussion is we're at a level where we contract to a level that it's uh, more cost effective to hire our own staff right. moving forward. But we currently have a relationship with both Constellations and Birch Tree to make sure that we're providing the services that are currently on the IEP. Okay, so despite that opening, we still have enough coverage. We have enough. We are currently covering through those contracted services. Okay. Our hope would be to move to, first of all, a collaboration between two BCBAs and district would create a nice partnership for a colleague um, rather than contracting out. So we're covering our services. We have room for growth, and we'd like, again, it to be a resource for interventions rather than strictly covering IEP services. Right, okay. I have another question, too. Yeah, um, did you see a shift in the number, either the number of IEPs, um, actually, I, I'm interested in both, the number of IEPs, did the, did the number of IEPs increase after the pandemic or during the pandemic? Um, um, and, and then my other question is, did you see a shift in the number of of students leaving the um, district and going to charters or other So schools. I would say last school year, I think we saw more students enrolling in different types of programming, private schools, charter schools, uh, et cetera. I haven't felt that effect as much this year in, in my arena, and I can't speak to just a, a typical student. As far as increase in IUPs, I think that is still in the process because there is a process when a student's referred of uh, 
a referral meeting, an evaluation. So the uptick in referrals could mean that we have a kind of an uptick in IEPs in the coming months. Um, and sometimes we always want to try interventions and making sure that we've done everything we can through our regular <laughs> typical resources. And some of those are still being uh, tried by school teams. Um, and so I think there's, there could be an uptick. These numbers that are on here are pretty similar to last year's IEP numbers. Again, plus or minus 10 to 20 students. Mm -hmm. Since I've been here, it's been in this kind of range. Um, we could see a slight uptick, but I know that teams are also putting into place plenty of interventions so that special education isn't the only resource available to, to um, handle any concerns that come up as a result of mm -hmm. remote access, <laughs> COVID, the social emotional, certainly that doesn't necessarily have to be through a disability. It could just be a reaction to the current situations that are happening in our, in our society. <laughs> but you said you are seeing an uptick in referrals? Yes, we have this at the beginning of this school year. <laughs> okay, thank you. Some of which are leading to evaluations, which could lead to identification, and some of which are just a group of people brainstorming around what does this student need at this point in time, but it's really not a special education issue. <laughs> okay, thanks. Just one, I just yeah. had one question, and I feel like I always ask this one too, but um, the, the percent of the school um, with IEPs, is, it's just interesting, you know, I mean, both, it, I understand these numbers are not um, yep. static, so this is a snapshot, but John Darrow and New Franklin, it looks like about 18% of the, the student body has an IEP, which yep. feels high. Um, and then at Little Harbor, it's 8%. And I actually don't know why I said it feels high. I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know what the national norm so, is right So I'll, now. Give, I'll give you um, kind of a benchmark. Generally, the state is running between 16 and 17% um, as mm -hmm. an average. Uh, and so, um, <laughs> and that's, since I've been here, there's a range of about 15 to 18% uh, in the last six to seven years as a state, if you look at the state averages. Uh, so 18% is on the higher end of that, and certainly Little Harbor's numbers are on the lower end of that um, kind of continuing. And that out? I mean, just the socioeconomic dynamics of the school, and obviously we don't want to sort of be equating that like, you know, poor kids are on IEPs and uh, you know, that sort of thing. I was just curious what like, what it, do you think It's something that the teams that? in the buildings are always looking at, and um, part of it is also then drilling down to what are the circumstances in any particular school year. Um, in some cases, at least one of these school buildings, I know we had a little bit of an uptick of move-ins that came with IEPs at the beginning of the school year that drove those numbers up. Um, uh, Dondero didn't start the summer <laughs> with those numbers, had a little bit of an uptick in move-ins or kids that came in with IEPs. Our concern will always be our processes for identification and making sure that we're following uh, unbiased, <laughs> valid processes for identification. Um, and so uh, a student that moves in with an IEP, we're gonna have that opportunity to look at that again in the future, but when they first come, we don't. Um, we accept the IEP and move forward. But that, that would be where we would kind of drill down to see, do we think we're making correct identifications in tandem what with is the, the What's the current thinking that around the gap then? What, what gap? I mean, just are around the fact that they're so high. I mean, besides this, it sounds like there were a few move-ins. Yeah, uh, again, year by year, that's looked at by the school teams. Uh, uh, I was a just variety of things come into play. Yeah. Certainly, socioeconomic status. Um, uh, we do have our homeless shelter located within uh, Don Darrow's bounds, and so uh, students can come in there um, mm -hmm. and many times may have IEPs, mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's a factor as well. Yeah. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, well, I don't, yeah, I don't have any other comments um, besides, you know, it's hard when it's like, oh, there's, you know, there's money and there's resources, I think, to Nancy's point earlier, or maybe where you were, where you were going with it, you know, and if, if it is a matter of, oh, we're, you know, we should be allocating more ESSER dollars outside of the budget cycle or whatever the case is, but it sounds like some of the, pain points right now are not necessarily just straight dollars driven, uh, it's, it's resources. And yeah, I mean, I can certainly say, and Steve and George and everyone, it's like if we could hire the people that we've even budgeted for or even had an application to consider, that would be a step in the right direction. It got to the point where I was in George's assistant's office and she was 
trying out the application system to see if it was working because we had, had not had a single touch of the application system for a three week period. And so she said, I went in and did an application to make sure that it wasn't like wasn't an broken. error because that's, that's the level of uh, non application yeah. that we've had this school year. <laughs> Which is consistent with yes. everywhere, everywhere, but yeah, that's, that's tough. Um, well, thank you, Jeanette, so much for coming in and Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you. Sharing with us. Thank you. Remember the days when we had keys and we had so much money to spend? <laughs> oh, my mm -hmm. God. <laughs> but today's interest, I mean, it's not even about that. No, it's just stuff. Hi, Nancy. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, are you comfortable you if I take this off? Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah, by all means. <sighs> so many hours of the day. <clears throat> well, I'm glad to be able to be here tonight, um, especially since a few of you are moving on to other things. So I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for support of me personally, but also support for all the learners in the Portsmouth community. And um, I wish you the best in your endeavors moving forward. And who knows, maybe yeah. our paths will cross again. Uh, you never know. So let's see, what do we want to talk about tonight? Um, our census, um, as of today, as a matter of fact, is 24. It's a little high for us. Um, typically, we like to be around 20, given our staffing. Um, we have 18 in-district uh, students. There is a waiting list for Portsmouth students. Um, and we have, as of today, six out-of-district students. And um, we started out pretty slow with out of district um, until quarter one closed and grades shook out and now we have six and I've got more interviews coming. Um, so there'll probably be a wait list for out of district also. <coughs> we are pretty lopsided in our um, classification of grades. We have 11 seniors, three juniors, five sophomores and four freshmen. And I have to say, you've heard it before, I'm sure that the beginning of the school year was bumpier than usual for us. Um, that's usually my favorite time of the year other than the ending of the school year, um, beginnings and endings. But um, we really saw some pretty um, concerning behaviors and safety concerns in the beginning of the school year. So what we did is we really kind of circled the wagons, increased our community building um, activities with students, um, increased our CQS mental health services from one and a half days to two days, um, hired a part-time paraprofessional, um, which has been amazing, um, and partnered with the Seacoast um, Y for increased physical activity. Um, we spend all day every day with our students, so our stu we are with our students during breakfast, break, lunch, um, class, and so we really made an effort to um, extend ourselves um, in an even more relational way to our students. And fortunately, by mid-October, I would say we had settled back down into a um, non-behavioral um, uh, place. So that was, um, that feels more normal to us and we've remained there. Um, we've continued all of our initiatives that I've told you about numerously in the past, so I'm not going to go into all those details. One of a couple of things that we've done this year is, as you know, we've had a relationship with Great Bay Community College, which we continue to do. Um, but we are are really looking at a lot of our students are not choosing to go to um, a two-year or four-year school. I'd say maybe, you know, two out of 23 will choose that path. So we really wanted to figure out how we can expose our students to employment where they would have a living um, wage and a health insurance without having to do a lot of post-secondary um, training, including even a certificate program. So on Wednesdays, we do um, a career days, basically, and we either have, we either go out to a business um, or we have people come in. 
and the kids had the kids then do a reflection after that um, and they have really enjoyed it and it's been kind of um, unexpectedly cool because the people that have come so far have really connected with at least one student um, and remained in contact with that student so I have to give a shout out to Jesse Anderson because he's an alumni of ours um, and an alumni of um, the welding program at the high school and he opened um, his own business in Barrington. And so we went there um, to see his shop. He also has a side business of a construction business too. Um, and he was able to share his story of um, how he was uh, when he was 15 years old and um, <laughs> kids were able to see where he is today, and then he hired us, of course, um, to do his lawn at his home in Dover um, for <laughs> Mr. Leaf Busters, so they were really able to see kind of a different um, world. He also donated, um, just love this boy, um, man, I should say, um, he donated a trailer with a leaf sucking uh, machine for us, so um, that was awesome. So he did a really great job. Uh, we were the first tour at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard since they started doing tours this year. Um, and we have two students that are um, targeted to apply to their apprenticeship program in the spring. Um, Irving Gass, who knew? Um, two gentlemen um, and a woman from Irving Gass came and they did an amazing job talking about their training program. They pay for students to get their commercial driving license. They do in-house training, starting salary at 18 is 45 to 50. Wow. 12 years ago, that was my daughter's tuition in first year of college. So, I mean, there was really, we are really trying to instill hope that you can um, be employed, be responsible, make money without having to do something that um, you don't enjoy, um, such as school. We, Waypoint came and um, shared about all the different positions in Waypoint. Um, we went to Great Bay Community College to their advanced manufacturing program. We're big fans of that program. We went to New Hampshire School of Mechanical Trades. Um, CB Honey came in because we did a um, thematic unit, um, really thematic quarter around beehives. We have four colonies. Um, the one has swarmed somewhere else in the universe. I have no idea where it is. Um, <laughs> So, um, but that was a real neat experience and our SMART goal was around um, vocabulary acquisition and so being able to have kids over all content areas looking at vocabulary in regard to hives and bees mm -hmm. and honey making and all the equipment and pollination and all that stuff. Um, it was really um, uh, a, a neat experience. And then we're going to move right into, in February, our maple syrup <coughs> collaboration with the third graders, so we'll continue that also. Lister Leaf Busters was up and running full time this year for the first time in a couple of years. We made, well, that's, we've got over $11,000, so hopefully, depending on what happens with COVID at the end of the year, we'll be able to actually take a trip. Um, so that will be exciting. Schedule-wise, we have done lots of different things. This year, to accommodate the physical activity every day and things like that, we have two intervention blocks during the school day and one after-school intervention block. We do all of our own transportation home for kids. So um, last year, we did three days of intervention block after school and no intervention block during school, and, um, and that was difficult. So this seems to be working a lot better. Students have been, with the exception of the bus, um, really good about um, COVID protocols. And um, I'm grateful for that. They've been, they've been awesome. And our staffing, you know, once again, I am so fortunate because the staff is amazing and they keep getting older and they don't get grumpy. Um, so they stay motivated, they stay engaged, they're willing to extend themselves outside of the school day. And as you all know, you know, as we get older and our lives get complicated and we may or may not have children, you know, your own responsibilities become different. So it's really um, a tribute to the staff that they're willing to do what they do to the degree that they do it. 
So kudos to them, they're amazing. Um, things that we have not mastered, um, <laughs> that we are still in the emerging level of competency um, is our transitions to the high school. And I know that what would work, we just don't necessarily have the resources. So we have five kids who will be over their third quarter for some class or another, some in CTE, well really all of them if you, because some of them are in the computer track. Um, the beginning of the year we had a couple kids, they lasted three days. So we know that we need to bridge that, and by bridge I mean go figure out a way that we can go with them, whether a paraprofessional goes with them to that class, that there's something around needing to do something to bridge that transition. Um, and we did that once before and that was successful. So we, we need to take a different look at that. Another challenge will be our possible, hopefully probable, move to a, a new school site. Um, who knows what will eventually <coughs> come of that. And then another challenge obviously will be the transition to new leadership both within our program, since I'll be also moving on, and within the district. Steve's been um, a wonderful advocate for us, so staff will experience that as a real loss. Um, so I think that um, as we get closer to the end of the school year, there'll be increased anxiety around what is that gonna look like next year. Um, our you know, work related to school board goals is pretty self-explanatory. Um, initiatives for a future budget. So depending upon what happens with the community campus, looking at how that space will be reconfigured obviously is, um, is something to have an eye on. And then I would really like people to consider um, the development kind, we've always talked about going, when we look at the program development, maybe larger in terms of our program. But what I'd really like to look at is the other end, you know, because even though we're so small, we still have students that are not successful in our program. And this year, I can think of two that are dear to my heart that for a variety of reasons were not able to stay with us. And they are at um, an out of district place. Um, well, I can't say what I was gonna <laughs> In a program that may not meet all of their needs. Um, so I would really like to look at flexing the other direction. So is there a way that we could staff with a teacher and a para, like a more of a tutorial program for students that aren't successful in our program but don't have to push them out of the district. We can push them into a more intensive, even smaller program. And my, I don't know the details, but my guess would be that there are students at the high school that may or may for a variety of different reasons have to be in tutoring of some sort um, that we could also utilize that model and then have different benchmarks and um, goals for them to hit to then transfer back into um, our program and we could utilize the same you know guidance staff because mental health so some program components would be accessible both directions do you do you mind? Yeah. Articulating that, okay. <laughs> so I think that I don't like it when we're not successful with kids. And I don't think that, um, I don't think people could do it any better than we could. So I think that, you know, looking at how we might be able to continue to serve those students that um, really are needing something even more intensive than what our program offers would be would behoove us to look at because, as you all know, um, when I'm looking at kids that are being referred to us, you know, we're being very selective. There are some, it is, it is a different ball game in terms of the level of complexity and the level of services. And you have to, it's kind of like that balance beam, you really have to look at who's already in your program and, and what the resources can withstand. So I think, I think that would be exciting and I think um, it certainly would be compatible with our philosophy about relationship and being able to um, repair and heal and restore um, and, and stick side by side. So I hope that that's something that in the future um, could be considered in regard to um, at the high school level anyways. 
And then, I've said this numerous times before, but um, going forward, I think the board is going to have to make some decisions about, you know, where your priorities are in terms of who we're servicing, um, you know, in district, out of district, a combination of both, you know, whatever. Um, <coughs> I think that's going to become more and more of an issue as you move forward. So, any questions? <laughs> Go ahead, Tara. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this is always one of my favorite presentations. It's like where I would like my student to go <laughs> to your school because it just, you, you do so many amazing things. So I appreciate all the work you've done. Um, I did have one question. I know that you work with the CT program and you're in contact with Courtney. Um, do you um, work with Steve? Um, Turner through her for big bring back the trades yet or you know he, we've done some work with them they came and mm -hmm. did um, a uh, workshop day with all of our students and had mm -hmm. different industry like different trades people there that was awesome mm -hmm. um, but other than that we haven't done a lot of work uh, except for refer people to their program to automotive and welding and right. yeah I think he does a I mean, he's expanding so much, and he does so many things for our, like, all the students in New Hampshire, but also, you know, around the country. Um, but I think he would have, maybe have even more connections for your, you know, your students who are interested in trades. It sounds like you have a lot mm -hmm. already, which is great, but I think it would be a good collaboration. Um, so. I agree. I forget, you know. I get mm -hmm. so busy in my day-to-day. -day. Thank you. Yeah. That's one thing I'm doing. I'm staying on the CTE. Um, board mm -hmm. um, so as I don't know what I'd be called but not as a school board member but um, I, I would mm -hmm. like to help set that up because I think he's great and I think it would be good for you guys to work together that would be great any questions or comments yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a very dear friend who I won't mention the name uh, <laughs> recently substituted at uh, the Lister Academy and he couldn't believe what a fabulous program it is um, how well organized it is he knew exactly what he had to do when he walked into that school um, so I just had to let you know that because I, I just had a conversation with this person so congratulations I mean it sounds like you run a top-notch program we all know that you do thank you it was fun to have him <laughs> but I have a um, Question, with 11 seniors graduating, are you worried about filling in the spots for next year? Um, well, so we have some that are graduating in January. So I have three that are leaving in January. So I think, um, no, because what I'll do is, <laughs> is I will um, front load. So I'll take more at the, um, in the spring. So, um, but I do, I do think it will be interesting because as you know, the out of district kids, that pool of students depends upon what's happening in the larger, you know, state. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that um, there's an organization here that lost a state contract, which means that a bunch of kids that need respite will no longer be local, they'll be going um, mm -hmm. to Nashua. And so, you know, all of those little things that change, you know, affect, you know, it's like that mobile affect everything else. So, um, but I think that we would still be able to maintain, you know, between five and six out of districts if that's the will of the board. Remember years ago when we had more out of district than Portsmouth mm -hmm. students and we were making some money on that program, but obviously we want the emphasis to go to our own students. So, mm -hmm. um, so and I guess I'm trying to ask we're not really making money on the program right now or, 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 um, or we do from those students that come from out of district correct okay. I think right I think that if you you know it's kind of one of those numbers games that if you added up all the 18 students and had to pay for them to go out of district um, that would be quite a yeah. plus transportation right. would be a lot of money Okay. Mm -hmm. did you want to weigh in on that no, I, I listen. This is this is great information. I'm taking notes. I'm trying to, 
And, I'm, and I loved your question because I wanted to ask it and I'm completely mm -hmm. panicked about where all the students will come from if right. it's, her vision isn't identifying where they all are. <laughs> but we, on, on paper, the program is funded um, in a, a transfer from the general fund to help as well as um, uh, from the tuition dollars that are raised. And, uh, and it certainly, in, in the very short time I've been here, a couple of, couple of cycles, it, it uh, is covering its costs comfortably. So it's, itself. you know, and I say that, covering its costs with that amount that we put in our budget, we know we're going to spend, and that it, uh, it hasn't needed more than that. So it seems to be right on target. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nancy, I think you alluded to this in, the, um, in sort of just the nuances of, you know, having the right group and the staffing and all of that, but the wait list that currently exists is there because of a variety of issues or because, you know, we you're just maxed out in terms of ratio or is it is it a it's, confluence of stuff just depending on who's on that wait list? Yeah, no, it's really more of a safety concern. We couldn't really take more kids right now unless somebody left. Um, because of staffing. And because of staffing and because of the complexity of the students. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else have anything else? Awesome. Yeah. Well, Andrew, yes. So. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ann. I, I had had one. I had noticed that you had the wait list, and I, and I understand how that works. Mm -hmm. I, I'm amazed that your leaf busters made so much money. Yeah, we've got some people that treat us very well, and they also have really big properties. So, <laughs> so I have to say that's not something I'm going to miss. <laughs> and, and your maple syrup. Yep, we're going to we're going to start that in Fed. Well, we'll start right after the holiday break, um, going to the elementary schools and doing some work. But yeah, then they the love, tapping, they love that. Yeah, the tapping will start uh, around February vacation. So as always, I always I love your presentation. Thank you for all you do, and your staff is amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank as you, uh, Nancy. I know you're retiring, and I just want to say good luck. And thank, thank you. you so much for what you've done for our school district. How many years have you been at Lucer Academy? It's I been know, a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. I think <laughs> since 2001, maybe. Uh, yeah. You are amazing. You thank really you. are amazing. Thank and, you. And good luck to you. Thank you. We'll miss you a lot. <laughs> yes. Oh, I know. I'll pile on because I was going to say the same thing to wrap us up, and I was ch I'm sending species <laughs> post it's like, is it? Is it public? Wait, is it totally public? She's mm -hmm. leaving. <laughs> like, oh, I've been yeah. shouting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think from the very first presentation that you gave six years ago in here, kind of in terms of someone who comes in and walks the, you know, walks the talk, the relationship piece, the conviction around your program, and just kind of that um, focus on individual kids. Um, thank you so much. And yeah. Ditto. Um, we wish you the best of luck. Thank we also you. have many months to celebrate you, kind of out right. the door, it sounds like. So no goodbyes yet. And hopefully okay. we'll see you before. Yes. Um, well, I have a goodbye. I, this is a little awkward. So please know that. Um, do you want to help me? <laughs> There's two beautiful young women who left. Mark said, would you mind giving these to? Um, oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Sarah and Kristen, um, awesome. Look at how pretty. But this now looks. it's like a terminal. Thank you. <laughs> 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 we're, we're like, thank you, Nancy and Jeanette. We're not going to stick with us. Yay. So thank you very much. It's Jeanette. from the board. Oh, it's from Wait, the board. You got yeah. it from <laughs> thank you, guys. You're welcome. Maybe some comments at the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's okay. I like peppering it throughout. <laughs> that's very yeah, good. Right. Right. Keep letting that happen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, all right. Moving on, then we're going to go to our superintendent's um, report, and you've got. <laughs> A little list on here. Sure, yeah, just uh, some of the usual things. Uh, the email correspondence that you've received uh, since the last meeting and a summary of that. Uh, you have, uh, and I think we've, we've talked about this already, just uh, we're heading into budget season, and so we have the schedule of dates uh, so that you can mark them in your calendars, particularly uh, our, our new board members as well. Um, uh, but uh, thankfully, our, you know, those, those of you stepping off the board will not have to 
uh, go through uh, multiple budget <laughs> meetings this year, unless you want to. You're welcome. Public meetings, you know. So uh, <laughs> welcome to come. Um, you have the December edition of the board and administrator uh, notice of some of the overnight field trips uh, that we uh, we are looking at this coming spring. Um, as, as Nancy alludes to, we, we of course are watching conditions and we'll follow all travel uh, guidance that we have, but we certainly look forward to getting back to some of our trips. Uh, you have the policy committee minutes, two sets of those, and both of them will uh, relate to some of the policies you'll discuss a little bit later in the agenda. <coughs> uh, and just because it was mentioned at, at public comment, I do want to take a moment and, and first and foremost uh, thank the uh, those involved with investigating thoroughly uh, the rumors uh, that were at uh, circulating around Portsmouth High School and on social media end of last week. Um, and I, I know uh, Principal Lyons has this on her agenda for the PAC meeting. Uh, I think there's a Zoom meeting tomorrow night. Um, and so, uh, but I would, I would say, and just uh, again, we'll go through a process of putting more information in the public, primarily so the public understands clearly what our process is. Uh, anytime something comes up uh, that could even be interpreted as a, as a rumor of a threat, um, it's a very, very thorough process. Uh, and I, willed, uh, I would just say, uh, in short, the incidents or the, the factors involved in the rumors last week actually were for three separate groups of students. It wasn't all tied into one student until it hit social media and then it became a, a one big threat. Uh, but it was actually three smaller issues that were quickly investigated very thoroughly quickly found to be unsubstantiated um, and uh, and then um, you know in the communication thereof after certainly we're, we're taking time to reflect on that and uh, certainly take some lessons learned to how we can better prevent uh, the spiraling of that kind of a thing um, but again her uh, PAC meeting is tomorrow night and also uh, I know she intends to send something out uh, they had a meeting of their crisis response team today so um, and that is the report uh, anybody have questions or additional comments on any of those items? I just have one thing. Yeah. Um, I just I pre I, I want to just say the same. I appreciate what the response was. I understand there needs to be a little more better communication, and I think that the new board and all of you will help with that. And but I felt. Like, I felt like some people were comfortable, some were not, and I think that there was a good job done on how to handle whether you were or not. Like, the kids who weren't comfortable going to school Friday were still still able to maybe play in their sports that night. Like, there was, there was definitely some flexibility involved um, based on comfort levels, um, and I, I think we have to, because of the... Um, because of what can't be said, we definitely have to have some um, reliance and trust in the people that we trust to do their job. So I, I understand there should be a little bit better communication, but I appreciate what was done. So thank you and to your staff as well. Thanks. Anything else on superintendent items? Okay. So Nathan, I think we'll move over to financial report. So the financial report month ending November 30th is in your packet. Um, I, you know, I, I I hate to be a broken record, but uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot about timing. And I, and you know what, we will in the next year. I mean, we we'll certainly hold on to. I mean, there's some value here that uh, I know the board has seen this for a number of years. Um, what I guess I would do is take you to this financial report uh, like I have in the past and remind you that there's some areas of red that you see down the center in the variance to plan. Remember that the plan is a, pro is a projection of how much you might reasonably have spent at this point based on the rolling average of the last five years at this point in the year. Uh, but with a, new, with a new business administrator asking staff to do some things differently, for instance, some of these things are popping out and, and they look like we're off the plan and ahead of the plan or behind the plan, I'm less concerned with some of these red items because if you take your your numbers on the far left, which is what you'd spent as of the end of November, and compare it to the next to the last on the right, which is your budget, they're they're very much within budget and they're very much within. Hey, we're 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 to November. There's still six more months, seven more months uh, to go, and so I. I'm not seeing anything jump out. You will see some, some big 
numbers that are not negative, some, some, you know, some variances in the other direction, and those are really driven by some of the vacancies that we're experiencing on staffing. Um, in, in addition to that, you'll see uh, uh, out-of-district tuition will pop out for you on page three, but the reality is we are way within budget, and in fact, that's really about the fact that the special ed office has been working hard to, to document and make payment in some of, the, um, uh, some of their bills differently this year so that I've got a better I've got better information to project how we'll end up the end of the year. Um, I've mentioned before to you that uh, middle of that page uh, that the impacts in central office and school board are really related to, for instance, we, we made an annual payment against the CRO, uh, CRO, the uh, school, <laughs> SRO, the school resource officer, um, very much so. And we made that payment in July simply to, rather than, rather than making that payment at the end of the year uh, to, to the other side of the city ledger. Uh, and, uh, and so there's easily some explanations here. We still have some dollars at the end of page three. They're sitting, um, we, they're dollars that have been identified as perfectly aligned with the uh, ESSER funding rules. And so we expect some of those are things like the tents that we had up in the field and some of the PPE that we continue to purchase for the schools, et cetera. So um, really not a lot of news there. It still seems to be marching forward. And I, I would bring it to your attention if I saw something that really popped and, and was of concern. Folks, have any questions for Nathan? Yeah. Hey, the really good news is the <laughs> dental insurance isn't over budget. That seemed to be like a you know, the last couple of years that I walked in, right. the dental was over budget yeah, cycle after cycle. We seem to be doing okay. Um, out of district tuition? <laughs> yes. Um, is that, again, a timing thing, or is that something that... Yeah, no, that really is. That one is, I mean, if you look, the year-to-date is at 770000 mm -hmm. The annual budget's $2.5 million. Um, it's simply that at this point, historically, mm -hmm. we hadn't made payments, and part of that is because um, uh, Ms. Souther and her, and her staff had identified in a couple of cases some tuition contracts that could be paid for discount, um, and they had a tax language that the full refund was available if the student for some reason stopped attending. So they made initial payments um, for, I don't know, for the quarter or for the six months for the semester. Uh, and so it looks, shows up red and says, wow, you're spending faster than you have in the past. And that's because they've made prepayment against some of those. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Kim. Um, the energy category, what's going on there? So. Uh, in energy, I think that's another classic timing. It simply is tying out uh, how we've paid the bills versus how we've paid it in the past. Okay. Um, although in this case, you see that it's the excess there or the overage is eight thousand dollars, and against a quarter of a million dollars, it's not much. But one of the things that uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Lynchy is finding is that the um, I think the the energy cost, the energy consumption at New Franklin, with the new air handling uh, in place is greater than we had anticipated. So one of the budgetary impacts that he and I have already talked about is that in that particular line for electricity, New Franklin will uptick a bit this, this year when you see the new proposed budget, simply because we, you find some level of efficiencies when you bring in the new equipment, but in this case it wasn't new equipment, it, it wasn't replacement equipment, it was new equipment. We went from having nothing moving the air to having these units that are, that are doing that, and, um, and we had estimated that there would be some increase, but it's greater than we had expected. So. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we can go into old business then. So. Sure, yeah. Actually, we want to roll into um, just a, a conversation uh, with you, uh, speaking of finances, of our ESSER funds uh, that we are uh, anticipating, that we've uh, had confirmation of in total in the order of 3.7-ish million dollars. Um, and one of the things that uh, we've done is uh, back, I think, towards the beginning of the year, we had put out a survey. We were trying to engage in some conversations with stakeholders just around what are the, um, you know, what are some of the possibilities with the use of these funds. We would always caution uh, against hiring a, a bunch of new staff, as Nathan's already said, um, for fear that we would face a cliff once the funds go away. Uh, but one of the things that um, I know you're well aware of the, that the city has been talking about is the purchase of community campus. And uh, one of the things that we have pursued a conversation with the DOE 
is to explore the use of ESSER funds for uh, a capital, um, for being a partner in that capital purchase of community campus for which we could talk about multiple uses. Uh, certainly one of the major uh, discussions would be the Lister Academy program itself in finding a much more suitable home for it or face um, what would be in a minimum $3 million, but more likely in the order of 8 to $10 million to actually do to Sherburne School what we've done to other facilities. So, uh, so we are looking at um, to see if there is approval or see if, if it would be possible for us to discuss using um, 2 million or somewhere in the order of dollars uh, for that capital um, investment with the city. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we've gotten some preliminary conceptual approval, but we don't know yet whether that would be formal. Uh, and if it were to come that it is a formal approved use, then we would of course still talk about is that, where does that line up against other discussions, other priorities here. Um, but we certainly would uh, hold out um, again what is an amazing opportunity to think about the use of the community campus space from a school perspective. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Nathan for anything else in terms of some of the process points for ESSER funding uh, and then um, see, uh, you know, some of the other things that we've talked about, some major possibilities with that. So, so one of the things, if I, thank you, Steve, if I, if I jump right on and, and suggest to you one of, the, one of the items that I'll speak to on Thursday night in front of the planning board uh, with our CIP submission with the city is that there continues to be a project proposed for the CIP it's, it, it now shows up in fiscal year 25, and that's a three, $3 million investment to, to make upgrades at Sherburn School for Lister. Um, we had our preliminary meeting with the subcommittee uh, of uh, the planning board, and that question was boldly asked, you know, quickly, you know, what I thought we were, you know, there's, there's this opportunity at community campus, what about this three million? It's, it's a couple of, it serves a couple of purposes, so when you hear us speak to it, uh, number one, it, it identifies on, uh, in a very public way for the state, for instance, that we expect costs to be significantly greater than what it might cost to be a capital partner at community campus. It will cost significantly more to make repairs and deal with what we need to at Sherburn School. Um, and, and, uh, and it also holds on to, for a, a city conversation, a dollar amount that's been in that debt plan for some number of years because we expect it to do something. So those are dollars that I, I suggested, I suggested to, the, to the planning uh, board subcommittee that day that maybe those dollars, if not used at Sherburn, could benefit other items in our out years of our CIP. So uh, I just tell you that because I, I know I'll talk to it again and it's not because we intend to do both. If we are, are uh, able to move forward and become a capital partner at at community campus and can move the Lister Academy program there, we certainly would not be looking to spend those kinds of dollars investing back into Sherburn. Also on the list of things that have come through the survey, and I spoke to it one night back um, over the summer when we talked about the survey results, but also from other collected feedback, there are, there are, um, there, there's an interest out there to introduce air conditioning and dehumidification into our schools that aren't already provided with that. <coughs> that New Franklin um, Elementary School is, we put the ductwork in two summers ago so that it has air handling. It was very timely that we, that we made that happen before COVID hit. But this summer we will put air conditioning and dehumidification in throughout that building. In the case of Dondero and Little Harbor, they have air handling that freshens the air, but no cooling. And, and so cooling zones that could be located in areas like, like the cafeteria or, or the library and some of, uh, you know, connected spaces to provide the principals with some cooling spots so that on those shoulder season hot days there'd be an opportunity to move students through. It may not, I don't know that we have the dollars to fully air condition either of those buildings nor both, but some cooling zones would go a long way towards giving principals some flexibility. Additionally, expanding air conditioning in other buildings, repairing and replacing windows to provide for uh, air, air quality and, and ventilation when need be would be um, items that could be considered on the list. In our survey and in subsequent conversations, there's been talk about advancing outdoor classroom opportunities and spaces. Uh, these kind of fall under the category that I spoke to a second ago and Steve echoed of one-time expenditures that provide for not only near-term but longer-term benefit for the district and, and, uh, and our students. Uh, 
purchasing activity vans has come up to add flexibility to district-wide co-curricular and extracurricular transportation. Um, and so, again, that would be something that would be a one-time thing that would have benefit for some period of time. But none of those are not to, not to forget that the survey and other feedback has also suggested um, adding to and providing social emotional learning and mental health staffing and supports um, uh, are important counseling and social work and, and, and there have been calls for staffing in general. Again, we continue to encourage the, the kinds of things that you can purchase and are one time don't have long term ripple on the budget, which can create challenges. But I, I wanted to make sure that we talked about some of those and, and so appreciate your feedback and the feedback of the public as we continue to march forward. Procedurally, we do have years yet to spend these dollars. So uh, the, the, it breaks down into ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, really, which are left. And, uh, and ESSER 2 can be spent through um, September of 23 and ESSER 3 through September of 24. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they're not immediate, some of the decisions that you have to make, although I think it's fair to also talk, uh, to, to discuss the fact that we continue to spend dollars <laughs> routinely on things like PPE and we went ahead and did tents for outdoor space and, and those are not yet charged off formally to, to the ESSER funds because you may choose to do something different with the ESSER funds but we, we are continuing to do the business of, of schooling in a, in a pandemic and so we're continuing to buy PPE and the like and so when you see on the financial and I've left it there for that benefit so that for that purpose when you see $130,000 spent it was spent on things that are classically, you know, or easily arguable um, <coughs> in the category of, of ESSER. And so some of the dollars are being spent and, and the set aside of 20%, which amounts to about 540 some odd thousand dollars over these years, uh, we're moving on some of that with some of the after school programming and summer program that we've already done. And so we want to be mindful of those and add to those as need be. But um, I haven't put it in writing, but I know that a uh, board member has a had asked uh, previously about the process and certainly I expect that at some point this list becomes longer and more formalized but it becomes something that you have as a document or as a, as a, as a dynamic resource to start contemplating um, so that ultimately the board can make some decisions about how we want to allocate those dollars across these priorities. Go ahead. Uh, thank you as always. Um, obviously, I'm not going to have a say in the matter, um, but I just want, you know, you talk about like one time, obviously that's, we have talked many times about the concern about spending things that um, would be a continued cost for sure. Um, I think having a few items that are um, one time, if there was any way to get staffing for the needs that we already have and that we want more of, like not yeah. only regular staffing but mental health, like if that was there, I think it would be wise to spend it anyway, just because we, the, the staffing and the hiring is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as we move forward, you know, you there are a couple of years to spend these monies and setting aside some of it. Like in an ideal world, we have all these people coming to us and wanting to work um, and setting aside some of that for that, but in the long-term planning, budgeting, like <coughs> knowing that we might want to add some, like maybe not all, because, you know, hopefully the need, some of the needs for the, um, the mental health will get a little bit better over the next few years and the long-term planning won't need those. So I think the balance is, you know, in an ideal world, if there was all these people, you know, working, um, that's what it would be. It would be a balance of the mm -hmm. two different types of costs and the staffing um, short term and long term into the budget. So, and, and we have talked about that, that staffing, it's, it's not that it's off the table, <coughs> but there has to be a phased in plan yeah. with it. And so even with the use of funds over the next two years, you could imagine similar to what we've done with some grant funded positions, we'll take on 50% of it in the second year, yeah. we'll take on 100% of it in the third year, something like that. Yeah. Hey, I don't want to, before your question, I don't want to forget the fact that I didn't add it to this list, I guess, because it echoes in my head more than it might in others. We took, uh, we took a hatchet to technology in this last budget round 
and we did so with the confidence that we had ESSER funds, mm -hmm. right, to, to, to backstop that. So Chromebooks especially, uh, and some of the other um, um, uh, networking um, infrastructure are things that we expect to continue to support with, and, and relative to relative to two two plus million dollars, or you know, the a million and a half um, that might be there, it's it's small dollars necessarily. Although it was big when we when we made the impact on our budget, so I don't want you to forget about that because I think the technology is another piece that wants very much to be addressed here. I do have a question, which I think is unrelated. Um, we all know that the effort for us to get sound barriers at in Franklin was declined by the state. Um, is there any way in the CIP if we could put it in for 2027 or 2028? I mean, can we have a placeholder for sound barriers at New Franklin? Obviously, the state's not going to pay for it. So do we have any idea how much it would cost for sound barriers at New Franklin? I don't have I, I, any I, 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 have no idea. I certainly will be, I will get educated. I, yeah. Um, I think in the out years there will there will always be an opportunity to have that conversation. It, we didn't submit it as a part of this 23-28 CIP that they're reviewing this week, uh, but but I know that that's been a very public conversation, and I'll I'll find some some data so we have a we have better information moving forward. I remember when I was on the city council. I mean, there's some items in that CIP that have been there for like 25 years, and they they just never get acted on. And I would hope that this would not be like that. But at least if we could get it in there so that it could it it would be in the CIP, that would be awesome. Yeah, Ann. I know that at the meeting that we had at, at New Franklin School, that there was a lot of discussion about. The, having air conditioning because uh, they, they, they don't want the windows open because right. of the, uh, the pollution and the noise and all of that. And there was talk about air conditioning for the building, so, so that's a possibility. So we're, I mean, and that's definitely, we're, we're moving ahead with that. The dollars were appropriated, or I say appropriated, the dollars were um, included in the last bonding resolution coming out of the CIP for 22. Um, we have uh, $1.3 million dollars that will separate and apart separate and apart from all of the other conversations we're having that's already been approved and that's um, <clears throat> and uh, and that's happening uh, you know it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult market construction wise in terms of the costs and such and so we haven't finalized numbers there but but um, we expect that we will complete that work this summer thanks for bringing that up Ann. yeah thank you Kip or Kim his thoughts is there anything else on this on what? Uh, just the <laughs> ESSER funds conversation. Okay. Thank you, folks. Um, yeah, thank you. So, I mean, thanks for just clarifying where we are. And, um, you know, of course, we, we're all eager to understand, like, the real feasibility. Um, and like Tara said, my opinion is, you know, one of a community stakeholder at this point. But, um, I mean, it does, I'm excited about Lister having a new home. It seems like a you know, <coughs> very ideal um, sort of situation. I'm excited about the school district having a, a true stake in that building um, over time. We would, I mean, I think that, I, I guess I maybe it's encouraging the new board, but to really understand how the purchase and the resources tie into other critical needs um, for the ESSER funds. Um, you know, it, Tara mentioned the, the mental health resources, after school programming, care expansion that is a pain point every single year. And I think if some of those um, programs are really um, clear on the onset and as clear as like, this is where Lister will sit, well, here's where the additional aftercare will be and that sort of thing, um, I think it's an exciting, could be an exciting move. Um, and I, I think you were, I, I think this is what you were saying too, Tara. Um, I hope during this budget process, and I was anticipating as you go into the budgeting process this year, that while I know it's dynamic in terms of how these funds are gonna kind of, um, you know, take hold over the course of three years, it does seem like there's gonna be pressures on the money <laughs> and we really have to get ahead of having a proposal on the table for 
$3.7 million that is going to get tweaked, you know, as, as time goes on and technology, all these different priorities, but um, that the, the school district is able to say, here it is, here's everything's been earmarked, here's what this looks like in, as, as we lay it down with our other budget. And then we can have the conversation because it's hard right now to say, you know, great idea when mm -hmm. it's still sort of nebulous where some of the other buckets sit. So from a process side, I mean, I, again, I understand it's not going to be static, but there does need to be, it seems like a static moment for a draft, you know, in January um, to just lay it down as a, so that's my two cents at before. <laughs> and then I'll come to public forum and see how it's going. But yeah, Kim. <laughs> well, I just wanted to bring up a point, Nathan. Um, you had said to me that we, we also have to have some caution because if we spend the money and submit it, there is always a chance that they can boot it back. Is that correct and say no? So the, the, the application process is uh, the application process is the cart before the horse. So we, we apply and, and, uh, and as long as we, we operate after we have received uh, application approval from the Department of Ed, then we should be fine. Okay, but we can't purchase and then say, oh, right. may I please have that money? And they say, no. <laughs> Which is why some of the decisions that we've made are, you know, we, we've, the tents and the PPE are, com are completely, completely within the spirit of the funding. And other districts have already applied and received. And so we are tracking those dollars with the expectation that we'll include those in ESSER 2 or ESSER 3 as, as we move forward. But we are, I mean, I like what Kristen just said, we, we are, um, we're waiting for some of the bigger, the bigger elements of the plan to kind of take shape. Are we doing air conditioning in a couple of the other buildings and what do those costs look like and how does that fit and the community campus as a, as a, uh, as a priority. Get and I, getting yeah. it all laid out. Now, I mean, I'm, I have a, I have a rudimentary one that I've, you know, the pluses and the minuses and the, you know, okay, this is great. Um, because we have conversations about COVID almost every day. Well, what about this, you know, and so-and-so had to go and pick up more masks. Well, put it in this kitty because I think reasonably that will be part of the PPE budget that comes out of this application, so. Um, what is yeah. the time frame on that? So when you think something goes in, then you submit it, an application to the state, is that correct? We, I mean, we're, again, uh, based on based on the fallout, or not fallout, but the result of some of the bigger conversations, yeah, we'll, we will submit an application to the state for some of the smaller elements, including the learning loss elements that we'll put together. Um, and uh, and that, ca that can be done. I mean, that application is an ongoing process, so you don't actually have to submit to the DOE the entirety. You can submit elements of it uh, as, you, as you move through, again, the two or three years that we're talking about. And then how long does it take for them to, to grant you the funds? So there's, uh, I've had mixed reviews from other business administrators across the state. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it, the review takes just a few days and sometimes there are questions and challenges and sometimes it can take longer. But by and large, the application process should not take, you know, should not take more than 30 days, I would get. I mean, that's just anecdotally in my mind, but it's the application process so long as your, your application is really consistent with the spirit, I guess for the public consumption, I should say this again, these are supposed to be things that are related to COVID. And so the state has given us the litmus test again of does this prepare for, prevent, or respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, so. Okay. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. All right. Um, so second thing on old business is actually the consideration and approval of two policies. Um, I wanted to ask, please, the rest of the board. We actually were interested in making a motion to move these um, two second readings to the January meeting, just given the kind of overlap in, um, you know, the EBCA is crisis prevention and emergency response plans, and that kind of lines up with conversations we're having, and there was some interest in potentially bringing some of this back to policy to just take a look at it through some updated lenses. And then, I don't know, for fire and all hazard drills, if it makes sense to keep those two together or? Yeah. Okay. So. Because um, that's the assailant. Do we need a, I don't know if I need a motion or not to, to move these to the January 
um, if it pleases. I'll move to do so. Thank you. Second. Second. Great. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, so we'll go ahead to new business then um, for the consideration and approval of um, some first reading policies. And I'll let Steve and any policy committee folks, um, do you want to, I think ideally we could um, take a motion for first reading as a group and then ask questions. Um, so do you want to do any kind of framing before Yeah, that? sure. I mean, it makes sense because it is first reading to uh, take them as a block and see uh, <coughs> what questions we have. We'll take all um, questions and comments back to the policy committee meeting. Uh, the first one is, is really out of, um, I don't know if Nathan, you want yeah, to speak this to this the, all. the first one is uh, one of the three items that, uh, that we were reminded of by our federal Federal grants review our fiscal monitoring. Uh, they didn't like that. They didn't like the version of drug-free workplace that we and drug-free schools that we were working with, and recommended that we update that to more recent language that has become um, commonly commonly implemented. So uh, we have used the policy recommendations coming out of the school boards association, okay. and uh, and and this version will satisfy Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that characterization matches the other three policies there, which is we are uh, taking a, a, a closer look at New Hampshire School Board Association model policies, updating policies as we need to for current changes in the law. And there have been some changes around the process for uh, student discipline, student conduct. So you would see um, policies JI, JIC, JICD all relate to student conduct in some way. Uh, and all of those are... Um, are modified to be more in line with the current model policies as well as the current laws. Great. Well, with that, and then we'll we'll see if there's questions or discussion for these. But can, uh, do I have a motion? I would move to approve. To approve for first reading. Second. Second. Thanks, Pip. Mm -hmm. um, any discussion or questions on where these are now? Kristen, I, I did have a question, I, and I can't find it now, but it, it, I thought it said that the school department will endeavor to give every employee a copy of the policy, and I thought maybe that should be changed to the school department will give. Am I right? Am I on We'll a, find that. Answer, yeah, yeah, it was something like that, and I it thought the word right endeavor is incorrect. Or yeah. We can be more explicit. <laughs> Error from it. Um, yeah, it was interesting to read the new drug-free workplace yeah. policy because obviously they are incorporating a lot more um, around, you know, trying to sort of manage the medical marijuana stuff and all the different pieces there and, uh, you know. And, and I, I can just offer up, the, in the fiscal crazy. monitoring, they didn't reference this section is wrong. You've used this. Mm -hmm. What they said was, That's interesting. you're a member of the School Boards Association. No reason why you wouldn't simply implement that. That will satisfy the, okay. the deficiencies <laughs> that the policy has. <laughs> so I can't even tell you what so in our old version. it's essentially mirroring what the School Board Association has. Because, because that has satisfied the federal law. Yeah. yeah. I don't have but there were some big changes. I mean, there's some. There were, yeah, there were a lot of changes. I don't know. Yeah. Does anyone else have comments or questions? I don't at this point. And for second reading. All right. With that, then I guess we'll take a roll call vote for first reading. Uh, Ann Walker. Yes. Eric Kennedy. Yes. Kristen Jeffrey. Yep. Nancy Clayberg. Yes. Brian French. Yes. Chris Coos. Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, guys. Go back to the. January as well. Um, pass it over for the duration of teacher retirement. Yeah, um, so uh, if it pleases the board, we would um, propose a consideration approval for a teacher retirement incentive, which um, is something we did not do last year. We have done in some years past. And um, typically, uh, we do see a net uh, financial gain for the the sort of the the swap out of salaries, um, but uh, but we, we would 
proposed to you the uh, last retirement incentive we had uh, was approved by the City Council with permission to offer it again under those terms at any time the board so wishes so we would offer up that uh, any employee with a minimum of 15 years of service eligible re for retirement who would uh, who would declare retirement and and retire would receive a one-time payment of twelve thousand dollars and any eligible member with less than 15 years uh, again is eligible for retirement and actually retires would receive a one-time payment of ten thousand um, dollars and so uh, we would offer that up for consideration to offer the professional staff the teaching staff um, with a, a date for them to acknowledge and let us know by January 21st. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and take a motion and see if we have any questions. Move, move to approve. Second. Second. Anyone have questions or just clarifications on this? I guess I'll just ask the obvious one, given we've had a, a meeting about hire, a lot of <laughs> questions about hiring <laughs> and thinking about um, vacancies and difficulties filling vacancies and then juxtaposing it with an incentive. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, we'll exclude certain positions <laughs> that we can. No BCBA may retire. No, um, so we, we are, you're right. And, and we're, um, as Jeanette had mentioned, we face the greatest challenge in our paraprofessional ranks right now um, with plenty of notice uh, which we would anticipate in this budget season to hire for the positions we wish to refill there is always that question over what we would do with the vacancies but um, if we can get those out in a reasonable time early this spring we have a lot of confidence we'll get all of those positions filled all right any other comments Okay, we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote. <coughs> Ann Walker? Yes. Tara Kennedy? Yes. Kristen Jeffrey? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Thank you. Um, great. So the last um, formal agenda item here is consideration and approval of two leaves of absence. Uh, yeah, and then we have the paraeducator MOA. Um, Sorry, it's not. <laughs> it's almost. Uh, but yeah, so we have two requests for leave of absence. One is a Portsmouth High School teacher, uh, Kate Fitzpatrick, and the other is a little Harbor teacher, Drew Macromo, uh, for uh, for a leave of absence uh, for the reasons they've specified in their letters. Okay, we'll move to approve. Yeah, we can take both of these together. Thank you, Anne, for the second. Uh, roll call vote. Ann Walker? Yes. Tara Kennedy? Yes. Kristen Jeffrey? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Thank you. All right. And so I apologize. Even my version does not have that on there. So the last piece. No, it's okay. Uh, so the last item is a uh, consideration <laughs> approval for uh, paraeducator MOA. This uh, MOA is very similar to what you've already passed for teachers and clericals and really just covers some of the considerations and extenuating circumstances we continue to operate under in our working conditions given COVID and the pandemic. So we would ask for your approval of this MOA. So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, any questions? Or comments on the MLA? I don't think so. We've had, you know, obviously time to re review and discuss and you know, feel good about where this is. So I think we'll do a roll call vote. Right. Ann Walker? Yes. Eric Kennedy? Yes. Kristen Jeffrey? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think that's it. Um, any committee updates or future agenda items for us? Before we wrap up here, I know. <coughs> okay. I have any. No? Uh, Kim? I can just mention that the um, holiday giving tree is up um, and you can, I think, do it virtually. So. I'm not, I don't have the link. I wish Nick was here because I'm pretty sure he would be able to explain it more. Uh, but it is up and there are leaves on the tree. So you could go into the school building and pick a leaf 
um, and donate. Or I do believe there is a website where you the can. The Rally Up Fund page. Did you yeah. have it? Fund page. Yes. Okay. What is it? Uh, long. Uh, why don't we just why don't we just forward it to the board? It's okay. um, go rallyup.com backslash PHS holiday raffle twenty twenty one. I'll ask Paulette to send it out to everybody. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for <coughs> highlighting that. Yeah, I was in touch with Sarah. What was her Hello, last name? Yes, yeah, so this week in the guidance office and yet there's there's like four different ways you can contribute right now. So there's lots of opportunities if you want to adopt a family or do the leaves or all this. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, I know other board members want to chime in, um, I'm sure, but uh, before we wrap up, um, we did want to acknowledge uh, the two of you uh, for all of your years of service and what probably seems like decades uh, <laughs> of service. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the, the school uh, department, we wanted to uh, extend to you um, gift certificates to our Gourmet to Go program Ooh. through our CTE program. Thank you. Um, you you've both not only um, been wonderful leaders in uh, particularly through our uh, amazing uh, roller coaster of a uh, last year and a half, uh, but you've been strong, strong advocates of our district work around equity and true leaders uh, and examples of what can be accomplished. So we really do appreciate all that you've done. Uh, for the district and for the students of Portsmouth. Oh, thank you very much. And oh, you can all get No, uh, I was just going to say on that note, um, we also have some fine gifts for you. And really, I hope you enjoy these because you deserve them. Um, you've worked really tirelessly and hard through a pandemic, which many people cannot say they have done. I mean, well, we can now, but <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, managing a board and um, a district um, with all kinds of meetings going to 12.01 a.m. in the morning one time and um, all the things that went on in between and quelling the voices and all of those great things um, really takes tremendous leadership. And um, the board has all chipped in, and we have some nice things for you to enjoy a spa day. <laughs> What's that? A spa day. Thank you very Thank much. You That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> nice wrapping, too. I don't well, know. Well, oh, no, I have to do it. I have my class. <laughs> Thank you. Get out the arts and crafts nice. bucket. That's awesome. <laughs> I just, can I say something? I, was, I, I was, had a conversation with a cousin of mine today and we were talking about Christmas Eve. And, you know, two years ago, 2019 on Christmas Eve, you know, she had 37 people at her house and we all had a big party and a Yankee swap and all that. And I was saying, I mean, just think about what's happened in those two, in two years ago. I mean, we had a normal life and now we don't. And when I think of what you two did during that pandemic to keep our schools together, to keep I mean, we had to, we, obviously parents were concerned, students were concerned, staff were concerned, administrators were concerned. I mean, you guys did an awesome job keeping the school department, the school board, and all of the people that are connected with it. Uh, we went through a world, we're still in a worldwide pandemic. And whoever thought, you know, two years ago when we're all <laughs> thinking about Christmas, <laughs> that this was going to happen. So thank you both so much. You're amazing women. You thank really you, are. Nancy. Amazing. Thank you very much. Very nice. <coughs> um, oh, did you yeah. want to say something? Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, <laughs> obviously we couldn't have done it without everyone sitting here and who is the people missing. Um, but I felt all the support, like, from this table, from the community, from staff, from students, from parents, from people who don't have kids in our district. Like, I felt so much support and throughout all of this and none of it was going to make me change my mind, but I really appreciated everyone who reached out everywhere. Um, I'm going to miss everyone a lot, but I will try to stay involved where I can, as I've mentioned. I just want to be a little more hands-on. You won't see me at a policy meeting. <laughs> I guarantee you that. Um, we'll stay out of that. Um, but yeah, so 
hopefully we'll all stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. I and know. I'd like to say to you too that um, one of the things that that I found myself saying consistently over the last two years um, in all the questions I would get about the school board, my answer would always be, yeah, but you know what? We work so well together as a board. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what, it, you know, if somebody has a different opinion mm -hmm. or we, you know, can't, we, we, we always seem to come to an agreement one way or another. And that is unique. I mean, I've Respect. sat on a lot of boards and I haven't mm -hmm. had that experience. So, and I, I think that that's thanks to you two in large part uh, in your leadership. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we appreciate. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much. It means a lot. It does, and um, appreciate all the all the kudos and the the love from everybody. And um, I know in it, we are gonna miss it in a weird <laughs> in a weird way. But also, yeah, hope won't be going too far, and hope to stay. Obviously, I have a lot of skin in the game in Portsmouth, and mm -hmm. want to stay uh, connected in some different things. So, um, and I yeah, I feel proud to have gotten to work with this group and. Um, yeah, we, we will always have many stories to tell um, <laughs> in terms of um, the last few years and, and beyond. So thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the board um, has really worked so well together. I'm yeah. sorry the other side here to, to join mm -hmm. us. but I, I Absolutely. So, so yeah, we're sending out the uh, work together <laughs> <laughs> collaborative <laughs> juju your way now, you guys. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, with that, and, and the flowers. <laughs> um, so Hope had picked up those beautiful bouquets, oh, and um, she, of course, had them in her car, and there was a little logistical problem. <laughs> so she gave them to Maya and Becky, who gave them to Nancy, and um, they are gorgeous. And, and she picked them out herself. Really cool. so, um, I can smell them through my mouth. <laughs> I know. We'll make sure and give her kudos. <laughs> that story is actually perfect. Like really pretty, and there was like logistically very difficult. So, yeah. <laughs> that tracks. Um, all right. Well, uh, with that, let's let's wrap it up. I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll do that. <laughs> Great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll say good night to everybody. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy oh my holidays. gosh. Happy yes. holidays. <laughs> <laughs>